just a little bit about myself. Um, so I work for a company called Compliance and Validation Services Limited and myself and the business partner run that. Um, we provide training, consultancy and validation services to the pharmaceutical industry. I've so been in the pharma industry over 20 years. I joined the pharma industry in 1993. Uh, prior to that, I was 15 years in the chemical industry, um, working on process and product development for large bulk inorganic and organic chemical synthesis and manufacture. So I was involved cleaning large-scale reactors and things like that on the chemical industry before I then moved into um, active pharmaceutical ingredient uh, validation and then pharmaceutical uh, product compliance and validation. Um, I have spent some considerable time working for, for big pharma companies <coughs> with what is now Sanofi Aventis, but was Fison's Pharmaceuticals, I joined in 1993. And I spent five years with them, and then I spent four years with GSK as a validation manager. And that's when all the grey hairs appeared and hair started dropping out and things like that. So uh, validation manager's job, anybody offers you one, we got any validation manager's job. Here. Quite a stressful job, really, because Everything seems to be your fault. If the processes don't work, it's validation's fault. If it's a bad regulatory inspection, it's a validation manager's fault. If it's bad validation that was done 10 years before you started, it's your fault. But there's a big plus because what you do see is you get a lot of experience in compliance and a lot of experience in terms of the manufacturing systems and equipment systems. So it's not all bad. There are some good things associated with that. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about today is around vessel cleaning. So to do this, I'm going to have to go into a little bit of regulatory stuff to why we need to do it. Also, to look at the kind of limits that we need to clean to. And then the kind of techniques for how we can get to that level of cleanliness. And I will talk about risk as well. And the techniques we'll look at will be you know, ranging from probably the most cost inefficient to maybe the most cost effective. Also look at some of the kind of customer practice that may not always be the best to follow as well as we go through. So I'm going to look at what is cleaning and cleaning validation. <laughs> Just incidentally, how many people from farm pharmaceutical manufacturer are actually in this room at the moment? A show of hands. How many from food, the rest food, fine chemicals, mm. hygienic industry? Hopefully, from any of those industries, there will be cleaning involved. And some of this, maybe not the regulations, but some of the techniques, hopefully will be applicable to you as well. We'll look at the cleaning processes themselves and the equipment required to do it. A little bit about vessel cleaning and considerations, and we'll look at the cleaning limits. So what is clean and what is cleaning? So, if you look up some of the definitions, Wikipedia is always quite useful, as uh, Magnus said. Um, <coughs> clean, free from dirt, soil, stain, or impurities. Could be classed as unsiled. In some cases, maybe unadulterated, not chain. Cleaning itself is the process of removing that dirt, soil, stain, rubbish, impurities. Now, the impurities, quite often, if you talk to people like Alpha Laval or <coughs> Steris who do create make cleaning agents, they'll talk about the residues as soil. It's a fairly common term, but it means the same thing. <coughs> Look at, um, it can also be removal of unwanted residues from equipment surfaces, and sometimes it can be termed decontamination. <coughs> now this all is covered under cleaning. So why do we clean? Well, in the pharmaceutical industry and probably most other industries, what you want to do is protect the product from contamination or cross-contamination. And that, if it's a pharmaceutical product, will assure patient safety. We're not giving them something that could potentially harm them that they don't know they're actually taking when they take a drug product. And basically, it maintains the quality, efficacy, purity, and safety. The kind of terms that 
the, certainly the American regulators use when they're talking about a drug product. We might clean so that we can actually reuse equipment. In a lot of cases, equipment is mostly made of high-grade stainless steel, or in some cases, glass. It tends to have a high capital cost. That fact that you've made a major investment can actually drive the reuse and in some cases multi-use. So we use equipment for more than one material or product manufacturer. And we do it so that we get greater return on our investment, we get greater equipment utilisation. Other reasons we clean is so that we can render the equipment and plant safe for access for personnel. So people need to go into a vessel to actually inspect it. We also clean, certainly in the pharmaceuticals, because the regulatory authorities require it. But cleaning can be costly in terms of time, energy and material stroke waste costs. Certainly a lot of cases I've seen in the past, I've seen very, very poor cleaning processes that require lots and lots of downtime. In some cases I've seen processes whereby it's not fully defined and it may take two or three repeats <coughs> of the cleaning process with testing in between to verify it's the right cleanliness level. Now, the regulators will not approve that kind of system. Clean until clean is not acceptable. You need a cleaning process that works properly every time you operate it. We should never really be cleaning something in the pharma industry because the regulatory authorities require it. That should not be an issue. The regulators are there to make sure you clean things, that your cleaning procedures are right and get into the desired levels with the risk to patient minimised. We shouldn't be thinking, oh, the, cleaning, the regulators are coming, we better start cleaning, we better start validating our cleaning processes. Primarily, we should be thinking of the patient. But it, Clearly, because it can be costly, it makes sense to optimise cleaning and get it right and do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. If cleaning isn't done properly, certainly to the pharmaceutical industry then, we have the potential to harm a patient because we can put something into a product they don't know they're taking that can be very, very harmful to that person. And also, if we start to do that, and the regulators know that we're doing that, then we can be subject to regulatory censure and we can also lose market confidence, which isn't very good for a pharmaceutical company. OK, so that's a little bit about cleaning. Now, what is cleaning validation? Whenever we talk about validation, usually it means generating documents. So test protocols, test reports, and you quite often see comical photographs of validation people with paper work about this high. You know, the more paper you've got, the more files you've got, the better the validation. You know, that, that is in jest. <laughs> but you know, don't judge the quality of the validation by the weight of the paperwork. It doesn't always follow. Or the more signatures you have, the better. That doesn't follow either. So we're generating documented evidence as part of the validation that the cleaning is effective, so it reduces contamination down to the required levels. Now, the one thing about cleaning, certainly in multi-use product, is if you're cleaning from and changing products between cleans, then cleaning will always have a risk associated with it, and your job is to reduce that risk to acceptable levels. There's never a case where you can fully verify that you've cleaned something until there's no residues there. It's usually you can clean something down to the lowest detectable residue you've got with your current method of detecting remaining residues after cleaning. And one of the things Magnus talked about was around disposable technology. Well, there are cost drivers, but there's also risk assurance or risk minimization properties we use it using dedicated equipment. If you dedicate equipment 
and it's a single use, then you have eliminated cross-contamination effectively. You can also, with disposable equipment, buy it irradiated and sterile so you don't have micro-issues. But not all disposable technology can be used on people's processes. It depends on things like temperature compatibility. But when we clean, talk about cleaning validation, it's normally around multi-use uh, stainless steel, <coughs> high-grade stainless steel equipment. Disposable technology, effectively, you start to remove the need for cleaning validation. And I did um, a rationale for a bio um, manufacturing company and the rationale basically concluded they didn't have to do any cleaning validation because everything was once single use. But you can't always use it. So we reduce contamination down to required levels on all product contact surfaces or all potential contact surfaces. We also make sure that we generated evidence that it's consistent. So we don't just do it once, we probably we do it three times or more to prove that something can do it every time. So we can summarise all that by saying, document, generating documented evidence that demonstrates a cleaning operational process is consistently capable of cleaning to predetermine levels of cleanliness. Now, one of the big concerns from a regulator, if it's not, it should be, is that there's a sound rationale for what those levels are because this is potential contamination that a patient can actually administer to themselves or have administered to them if they're in hospital or something like that. So we need a well-developed, approved, effective cleaning process. And in the EU GMP guide, which is Utrelex Volume 4, which is freely available to anybody that wants to read it on the internet, uh, they say that it's documented evidence that an approved cleaning procedure provide equipment which is suitable for medicinal products and that's suitable basically covers a lot of the things we talked about there so suitable means it do, you don't contaminate your products to unacceptable levels now the key regulatory standards and international guidance there are lots and lots of guidance in cleaning validation in the regulations and in various international bodies and the reason for that is like sterilization, like aseptic manufacture, it is a critical area. It's critical because if you get it wrong, patients can be harmed. You can give them something that can harm them. So we have in the European Union, EU Volume 4, which is a GMP guide for both veterinary and pharmaceutical products. And the areas where you'll find a lot of relevance with reference to cleaning validation is in the basic requirements for active substances used as starting mm. materials. So it's the manufacture of active pharmaceutical ingredients or bulk uh, chemicals. In Annex 15, which is in EU Volume 4, which is on qualification and validation, and there's some sections on cleaning validation. Also, we have the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention and Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, and I wish they would shorten that. So I refer to that as PIC, so I won't say that mouthful again. And basically this is an organisation where various regulatory bodies, all the European and various worldwide ones, get together and produce a set of guidelines for inspectors which will act as a fairly common reference document so we can get common inspections across Europe. And they have one on recommendations, on validation master plan, installation and operation qualification and non-sterile process validation and cleaning validation. So there's quite a lot of information in there. The Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which are the regulators in the United States, they have a guide to the inspection of validation and cleaning processes. Very old now, but that is a guide for their inspectors that they will use as a template for their inspection. So, even though you don't comply with it, you expect it to know what's in it. And if you do something different to what's in it, then you'd expect to have a rationale to talk to your inspector about if you were inspected. There's a very useful guide as well produced by Health Canada, which are the Canadian regulators. There are more than these. These just are what I find the most useful ones. 
with the most information in. And they produced cleaning validation guidelines, which came out in updated in January 2008. And then probably the Bible for biotechnology cleaning, which is the PDA technical report number 49, which is one of the best guides I've actually read that's out there. Um, very useful document, very much focused on biopharmaceutical plant cleaning. And it gives example limits as well, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Just a little bit about cleaning and microbiological contamination or microbial contamination. Cleaning can reduce microbiological contamination, but it should never contribute to it. So the last thing we want is a cleaning procedure that contaminates our equipment with microbiological organisms. So leaving a CIP system or cleaning place system that's wet, standing around for a long time, that can build up microorganisms that you can then pump into your vessel is not a good idea. Um, for example, they also use cleaning to reduce endotoxin levels, and that can be multiple wash cycles with water for injection, which is one of the pure waters that you can get. Um, that's used for heat sensitive components in sterile manufacture like rubber stoppers for vials and things. They will wash that in multiple rinses of WFI. Everybody know what endotoxins are? Uh, yeah. Okay. Nobody says not, so I don't have to explain it, but uh, if you want to ask later, you can do. Um, but don't confuse cleaning with sanitization or sterilization because the sanitization and sterilization kill rather than remove. You can sterilize something full of gram negative organisms and it can leave a lot of endotoxins around. So it's a different process. So that's a little bit about the background of regulations and what is cleaning and what is cleaning validation. So what I'm going to look at here is the cleaning processes and cleaning equipment, which is probably one of the, the major parts of this presentation. So coverage and turbulence. Now, whatever you're cleaning, there are some very important rules here. We must ensure that the cleaning solution is in contact with all the surfaces that you intend to clean. If you have zero contact, then you're going to get zero cleaning. Okay. Now, some might argue, well, what if you've got a vessel full of solvents and you heat it up and it condenses on the lid? Well, effectively, you're getting contact there. But generally, there's not many processes, apart from some small molecule API plants where that's involved. Generally, you're using spray devices. If that spray device doesn't spray a particular part of a piece of equipment and wet it, then you're not going to get cleaning. And we'll talk about the significance of that a little bit later. We'll also want to generate turbulence and a level of impact to facilitate timely removal of residues. Contact doesn't necessarily mean quick cleaning. And I'll show you a few very simple slides which have got nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, and nothing to do with fine chemicals, more to do with dishes and honey in a few times. And the other thing is ensure that we can drain it as well. So some key rules, and if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, then please remember this one. So, here's my dishwasher at home. Question for you, will we achieve coverage? Anybody think we will achieve complete coverage there? No? <coughs> yeah? About here? <laughs> there is one underneath, but these plates are on top of each other. How are we going to get cleaning fluid into that? It's not that obvious from back, the back of the room, but there are two plates sitting on top of each other there. So we might clean this plate, we might clean this plate, we're going to struggle to clean these two. We're certainly not going to clean this one here. And then we've got a chopping board blocking maybe the spray to the other one. So it's just trying to make you think about maybe something you can all relate to. 
I mean, I, probably most of the men have to unload the dishwasher. I usually sat my wife because she does that and I end up having to put it all back in again. I mean, she does that deliberately so that I always do it, basically. But uh, that's just the manipulative mind of my wife. I won't say women because that's sexist. So. Okay. All right, another example. What about this one? <laughs> I mean, it's possible, but what have we done? And this is what my wife does quite often. <laughs> Blocks the rotation of this uh, spray device. So it's like having a spray ball that's meant to rotate and doesn't rotate uh, effectively. So not a good idea. How about this one? There's no catch there. If there's equal space in, things are in. Notice I've done a risk assessment for safety. All the knives and forks pointing down. And that's by example, because I put a sharp knife in, it's pointing up, put my hand in to pull it out. So you can do silly things. So I don't expect you to do a formal risk assessment for loading and unloading the dishwasher, but uh, just common sense is probably a good idea there. Okay, so is coverage. So we've got full coverage here. We've got static immersion. So this is our starting point. And this is a N for Nathan, who's my son. And we've dropped that then into water. And it's sat there for five minutes. What's it done? Virtually nothing because what we're getting is high concentrations of honey at the interface with the water, <coughs> so our level of dissolution is actually quite low. So there we've got brilliant coverage, but we aren't necessarily cleaning very effectively. And so static immersion can take quite a long time. We could probably leave that for a day and it will still be visible. But if you look at the difference here of rinsing, that's my, my thumb there. Quite difficult actually doing that and taking a photograph yourself. So if you, if you want to say well done, that's fine. But there you go. Rinse time, 20 minutes, it's starting to disappear. Because we've not only got coverage, we've got turbulence and we've got level of impact. We've then got 40 minutes. And I've left the tap, I'm not cheating, I've left the tap in a fixed position. Not locked, but fixed. 60 minutes, now there is some there, but it's getting very difficult to see, certainly from the back. Um, 90, sorry, I should have said 60 seconds. 90 seconds, virtually gone, there is a slight bit there. 120 seconds, it's absolutely disappeared. And if I turn the tap up more, what do you think would happen? Blast the tap at it. Possibly, am I going to increase the amount of time it takes to clean? No, we're going to reduce it. So the more impact and more turbulence you can get, well, you've probably already got turbulence. It's the impact when you start increasing the flow from the tap that starts to make the cleaning more effective. So, I mean, everybody can relate to that. And has anybody ever emptied the dishwasher and found a plate that was probably never put in properly or a plastic one that's flipped over? you end up with that and that's got some uh, corn flakes in it or something. So uh, obviously no drainage isn't a good idea either. So we need to make sure we can drain the spent cleaning fluid away. Okay, a little bit about manual cleaning. I'm not going to talk about manual cleaning much, but here's our guy here. He's, oh, how did that happen? He's a the guy there and he's uh, pressure washing some kind of vessel. It's probably, I don't know what it is, I just found it on the internet and, and probably committed all kinds of, uh, oh, this is being filmed, isn't it? So, <laughs> all kinds of copyright issues, sorry. Um, don't distribute this film too far, please. Anyway, manual cleaning has some very serious, very serious drawbacks, but it's amazing how much manual cleaning takes place in the pharma industry. And if you're a regulator, then one of the areas you'd want to focus in, I would anyway, 
is manual cleaning. How do you validate it? Typically, it requires extensive equipment. Disassembly. If you've got people entering a tank or sticking their head in a vessel or tank, then you're going to have to have some confined space protocols some safety permits. You may have to do gas testing and all kinds of things before you can do it. If you've got many internal devices inside there, like baffles, agitators, it's going to be very difficult to actually clean it manually. And the operator, we use brush operator, that's if he's got a brush and he's cleaning, has to work very consistently in all areas on every clean to do it properly. And if you've got manual cleaning, then you have to do a lot more testing, a lot more training, and a lot more retesting and monitoring. So the costs actually carry on just building up with doing it. But more fundamentally is you cannot always guarantee it's clean. Other entering a tank or vessel can actually introduce new contaminants that weren't there before. What's the guy carried in when he's gone in there? He just walked through a field and then he's waltzed into a vessel, for example. And the, as we say, one of the key things is little assurance that repeated cleaning cycles will be uniform. And validation of a manual cleaning process is, I should say, very, very difficult, if not impossible, because of the inherent variability associated with this. Sometimes you see hybrid systems where somebody does a bit of manual cleaning, and then they do a CIP after it or something like that, if there are areas that are difficult to clean. That is better than just pure manual cleaning. But if we can automate it and do it without this person, it makes a lot of difference. Probably reduces your labour costs and downtime costs as well. Now, there's other reasons you may not want people to go into a vessel, and that is if you're using very highly active compounds, whereby... There's very, very small amounts used in the drug dose, but the operator could be exposed to dangerous levels. In that case, you don't really want to be disassembling something and putting somebody in there. So, if we look at cleaning processes and what's involved, there is a lot more than one parameter. There's generally multiple parameters. How you clean can reduce the effect of some of those parameters and move the weight from one to another. But generally, one of the key ones you'll see is tact, the time, action. If we're looking at spray devices, then the type of action we get is very dependent on the design and the type of spray device you're using. And we'll look at that later. There's chemistry. So what's the chemistry involved? Are we dispersing? Are we hydrolyzing, breaking things down? Are we degrading something so it'll clean easier? There are lots and lots of things involved. The concentration, if we're using a cleaning agent, it could be an acid, an alkali. What's the concentration that we're using? Coverage is something that should be full. And that, as we say, we don't want things, we can't clean if we don't cover. And the other one is temperature. And that comes to one of the things that's been used, I know Sterish use it, and I think I've seen it in some of the alpha level down at known as tact. And the cube is because of the chemistry concentration and coverage. Now, another way of looking at it, and this is courtesy of a very old alpha level, I think it was tough to at the time, but to me it makes sense. And it looks at breaking it down into some of the things associated with things like cleaning place through spray nozzles. We have a time involved, which can be dependent on other things. But in this, it's just showing time, volume, level of impact, and we saw that with the water flowing over the plate. Manpower, manual cleaning, obviously that manpower, depending on how it is, can be quite a big proportion. And then chemi chemical or chemistry and temperature. And things that will challenge the cleaning process are going to be what is the type and level of the residue we're trying to clean, what is the condition of that residue? Is it hard, soft, loose, adhered? What is the rinsing require? Um, usually involved in removing the cleaning agent at the end of the cleaning process. And there's also big environmental impact in, cleaning in terms of getting rid of spent 
cleaning agents and residues from the cleaning process itself all add up to various challenges and when we look at the spray devices and the type we look at how that can change that model now if we're looking at CIP where we've got a completely automated non-manual process then we will take that man manpower segment out unless you want to put something in for pressing a button on a programmable logic controller but basically the manpower in the CIP system is nothing so okay now as I mentioned before, a lot of new drug development, there's a big trend in increasing the level of potency. This means you need a very small, a much smaller amount of the drug to, to have the same therapeutic effect, so you use less and less of it. And when it was a Glaxo, we were getting into various steroids that had very, very low dosage levels. But you didn't want to get people manually cleaning or handling that material because they could be exposed to grams of it when micrograms could kill somebody. So there's a trend of increasing potency in the industry. And 10 years ago, uh, in terms of operator exposure, it was probably around 100 micrograms per meter cubed. And that's slowly gone down to 10 micrograms to, in some cases, one microgram per meter cubed with highly active pharmaceutical materials. And if you involve with using hormones, then you may be down to 30 nanograms per meter cubed. So this is dri driving a change in plant design so that you actually, actually force you to move to not taking equipment part and to having fully automated cleaning place systems, which is great for spray ball manufacturers like Alpha Lavelle because it gives them the opportunity. But there are other people out there making spray balls. They have competition like big pharma companies have competition from um, generics and things like that. But obviously they make very good quality products. So in some cases some of the equipment for manufacturing because it's highly active can also be put in isolators which can add another little bit of problem and I know we touched on isolators and restricted access barrier systems earlier but I'm not going to talk about that maintenance this time. Okay, so clean in place. Everybody know we talk about clean in place. Basically, you don't you clean it as it is where it is. You don't take it out and put it somewhere else. Basically, without this and that. So the design of the process equipment, together with the CIP system, is critical for clean in place systems. Now the level of disassembly is low to zero. So every time we clean, it has to work. In a lot of cases, when you're looking at, you may validate it, you may go in there, visually inspect, you may swab the surfaces, determine you've got it to the right level of cleanliness. But once it's all assembled and you're going to routine manufacture, you may even just have a sight glass inspection. So you can't see everything. So you need to know it works right and every time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. If it doesn't, you'll be unwittingly contaminating your product and unwittingly doing a patient some harm. We don't want that. Now, the other thing is the type of spray nozzles that we use in that system and their positioning becomes very critical as well. Now, to do that properly, it needs to be all done at the design phase. And this is why sometimes retrofitting can be quite difficult to do. If you can do it you know, with the design phase, it all helps. But basically, you want to assess the areas that are most difficult to clean when you're looking at how you're going to clean the tank. And that, some of the biggest areas are the vessel lids, so the portals or nozzles, as they're, they're called, obstructions, baffles, agitators, instruments that actually intrude into the area. And basically, a general CIP sequence will involve preparation of the cleaning agent that can be quite voluminous it could be high temperature it could have a lot of cleaning agents in it could be quite costly delivering of that material that chemical to the dirty equipment so we want to get full coverage to make sure it cleans so making sure that we get it everywhere not always easy so this is where the design and type of spray device is quite critical then we dis need to just dis discharge that used fluid to drain. So the more we have of it, 
the more we have to get rid of. So that just kind of keeps building up costs associated with it. Then we want to remove any cleaning agents by rinsing. That could be we're rinsing with high quality water. So it's quite important that we can minimise that because there's going to be cost involved with water systems. And I don't think you, you, you mentioned water systems have a big cost associated with them. And then we want to dry the equipment. They're optional. Most of the regulations say equipment should be left in a clean, dry state. The only time when you probably wouldn't is if you're following it with a steam or sterilising place process where you clean it and then go straight into a, steril a steam sterilisation. It's probably where the only case you should leave it wet. Generally, it should be dry. Now, CIPs, there are generally three types. There's probably the most energy inefficient and the most <laughs> worst case for use of chemical agents. And this is basically a one through system. So we basically have our detergent, and we then may have a, a mixing process that mixes it in line. We have a cleaning place pump that sprays through a spray nozzle, sprays the inside of the vessel, and then we run it to drain. So it just runs through. <coughs> And then basically for the final rinse we do it, we just water to make sure we take the detergent out. Now the advantages are it eliminates the risk of cross-contamination from the CIP system. It is simpler and it requires less control. Potentially simple, simpler piping configurations as well. The disadvantage are quite large. A large CIP fluid consumption, especially if we've got spray, static spray bottles, which tend to use more volume, significant effluent handling, high energy consumption. <coughs> so quite often I've seen that, but it isn't a very effective way of cleaning in terms of the cost. And then there's a simple recirculation system around the CIP package itself. So in this case, we basically uh, pump our detergent mix through the vessel. That could be a vessel that makes it all up, basically. That's just a simple schematic. Pumps it round, and then we return it back around and carry on recirculating that. Now, there are some advantages. We have a lower CIP fluid volumes than the ones through. It doesn't require the process pumps to be sized for CIP parameters. CIP parameters will be around the requirement for the spray ball. So we'd have to make sure our process pumps, if we didn't have that system, could do that. Uh, doesn't require all the CIP envelopes to have a recirculation pump. Disadvantages, it requires larger CIP volumes than recirculation within a CIP envelope. We'll talk about that next. Potential to contaminate the spray devices and the CIP distribution will recirculate residues. So we'll have to make sure that our CIP system is validated as well, so we don't leave a residue in there before we clean another product. So you shouldn't really see this on a multi-use plant very often. It can cause a lot of problems, and you can double up on your cleaning validation. Okay. Um, third type is recirculation within the CIP envelope. So basically, we put our CIP through our spray balls, our CIP medium, and basically we then put it in and keep recirculating it. And then there may be a few cycles where you put some more in and recirculate and run to effluent. So you're running, you're using the process pump to actually clean the system through the spray balls. In some cases, this could be coupled up to uh, hard coupled or flexible coupled, depending on, and then transfer to the equipment water in as well. So here, the CIP fluid is pumped to the equipment and then recirculated around the equipment with the spray devices. The advantages are smaller CIP volumes, eliminates contamination of the CIP supply, but the disadvantage is it requires all the CIP envelopes to be equipped with a recirculating pump, Process pumps have to be sized for the CIP parameters, and spray balls can be contaminated. 
in some cases endpoint detection with this, especially if we're looking at conductivity and things, can be a little bit more difficult. But you can protect spray balls with, with filters or strainers in that system. Certainly if you've got static spray balls in there, you'd want to do that. <coughs> anyway. So, a little bit about CIPs, and we'll look at vessel cleaning itself. And I think most people here are involved in sanitary, um, if not pharmaceutical equipment. Now, there's something called hygienic engineering. There's a lot of that explained in the ASME BPE guide. And there's a definition in there of hygienic engineering. And it basically says equipment and piping systems that by design, materials of construction and operation provides for the maintenance of cleanliness so that products produced by these systems will not adversely affect human or animal health. And it basically relates to the cleanability and the various things. And I have part of our cleaning validation course, we have a two hour presentation on hygienic engineering. That's as much as I'm going to say, basically. It relates to self draining, crevice and imperfection free surfaces for the contact surfaces, minimal and acceptable dead legs. Wherever you've got dead legs, you've got potential for <coughs> contamination to reside and not be cleaned. The drivers for hygienic engineering come from regulatory requirements, industry standards and practices, various company standards, GSK, Genzyme will have corporate standards about how to design various plants for various types of products. The stage of the process, whether it's final stage active pharmaceutical ingredient, whether it's just secondary pharmaceutical manufacture or steriles. Once we start getting into steriles and things like that, we're quite getting quite heavily into hygienic design. The type of process, whether it's aseptic, whether it's monoculture fermentation, bioprocessing, highly active processing. And also, hygienic engineering is involved in water systems, and in some cases, steam systems. And a lot of hygiene Hygienic design is related to effectiveness in terms of cleaning of residues, chemical and microbiological. So a little bit about vessel design. So there's a magnetic uh, agitator there at the bottom. But basically for hygienic design, not always possible in certain fermenters, but minimal internal components, appropriate surface finish, minimum nozzles or portals with short branch length and hygienic connections, flush runoff valves so that we've got some runoff valve that's flushed to the, to the line of the tank itself, and having the right level of seals where we've got um, shafts for agitators, where we've got drives on pumps and things. We want some kind of dual mechanical seals or magnetic drives or agitators. Now, if we can get that right, what we're starting to do is we're minimising the challenge to the cleaning process. If we've got something full of crevices, full of internals, there's more and more areas for residues to build up. If we've got more portals, or we've got a vessel that's got 10 spare portals we don't need, we're increasing our cleaning challenge. <coughs> now, the cleaning solution must contact all surfaces. Remember, if there's no contact, there's no cleaning. And we can improve that contact by increasing the number of spray devices or even changing the spray device if we've got one that doesn't work very well. Changing the spray device will change the impact. We'll look at that in a few minutes. We target all hard to clean components. So things like top head mounted agitators, nozzles, baffles, we need to target those and make sure they're being cleaned. If we've got charge suits or shoots or manway collars, we need to target those. But quite often, there's always a compromise between cleanability and the process operability. Having the most cleanable vessel, we may not be able to produce anything in it. And if we talked about types of agitators and things, well, the most cleanable vessel is one without an agitator in, and one without any nozzles, so we couldn't get anything in there. There's always a compromise between that. In to improve the surface finish, and in ASMA BPE, there's a guide to various surface finishes. And the basis there is 
if you've got something that likes to adhere to a surface, then 10, roughly the rougher surface, the more it's likely to adhere. So if you've got something that's mirror polished, then potentially there's less chance of it adhering. So we reduce the ch challenge to the cleaning. If we reduce the challenge to the cleaning, then we can reduce the time, reduce the volumes and energy associated with it. And the one thing we can do, there is an industry standard test called the riboflavin coverage test. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. So we use riboflavin. When it's wet, you can spray it on the inside of a vessel. And in the dark, you inspect with a UV light, and it fluoresces in yellow color. So you can see that it's covered. And then you go through your spray device cycle, and then you look for residual riboflavin. If there's none there, you've got good coverage. But it doesn't mean you've got turbulence. It doesn't mean you've got a high level of impact. It just means you've got coverage. So if you can make sure you've got a high level of impact in all areas, you're going to increase the rate at which you clean. Now, turbulence on vessel surfaces will accelerate soil removal. And we saw that with our honey challenge. We increase the turbulence. We increase the speed and that we actually clean the soil. And things like dish head vertical vessels tend to be cleaned if we're using static spray devices. Static spray devices are something that's fixed with holes in that direct the flow at various positions. Um, I have seen somebody retrofit something with spray balls and just put a general 360 spray ball in there without any thought to how they're going to clean the nozzles. Obviously, they couldn't because they haven't done it properly, but we'll see an example with that. So with the static spray balls, Basically, the, the, the dished heads and nozzles and knuckle of the vessel are cleaned with directed flow impacting them. And then you tend to create a flow down the sidewall, hopefully with a bit of turbulence to clean the sidewall. So we end, we end up with a sheet in. And that's out one of the ASMIS PPE. I think it's a 2009 guide. There's a little bit more in the later version on. Now, in the ASME BPE does give you some examples of flow rates. So here's our vessel, and this is our static spray ball. And we've got purpose-built holes drilled to spray various parts of the upper surface. Now with, so custom drilled means it's been drilled specifically to direct water or cleaning fluid to certain points in there. So we've got a spray going up to clean the nozzle on which this is in. We've then got sprays to impact on the surface. We've got some sprays directed so that we impact behind this baffle. Sorry, I'm pressing buttons too quickly here. Stop it. Right. Patience, Mike. So here we're creating then a flow as we impact that runs down the back of here. We've got impact onto this baffle that's creating a flow down. And then we've got flow directed through holes, which hits the nozzles or portals here and creates a sheet down. And then that cascades down the side. And of course, we talked about we have to drain something. Then we have to drain that from the vessel. And that's why we've got a dish bottom so that we can actually drain it. Now, in the ASBE BPE, it provides guidance to the level of volumes that you need to create turbulence to allow you to clean those sides. It's not a very effective. The impact level here is very, very low. The impact here is higher, but there are ways of achieving more impact than that with different spray devices. And there's a few examples of typical flow rates which are given in gallons per minute per feet, and I've converted that to uh, litres per minute per metre, per metre, just for yours. But if you want to look at those typical flows, they are given in the asthma BPE. But if we're using static spray device, then usually we'll have custom drilled. And we need to test that with riboflavin. We may then have to go back and drill more holes or change the spray device to make sure we get full coverage. But that will give you a reasonable level of clean, but maybe not the most effective clean. Right, spray device choice. This gets a little bit more into Alpha Lavelle's area here now. But for many years, even decades, spray devices 
considered the only safe, sorry, static spray balls were considered the only safe option for CIP use in critical environments. And probably really the only ones available until the late 90s. And from the late 90s, 1998, some rotary device that actually met some sanitary standards became available. And from then on, they become more and more available and more widely used. So there's a various uh, 3A standard that the first spray device, rotary spray device, came met. Uh, and basically up to that point, the unwritten rule was that static spray devices were the only ones that could be safely <coughs> used. The other thing is users, because of this history, expect to see them and don't question the use of static spray devices. And as we said, somebody mentioned before, that in the farmer industry, things don't move that quickly. And changing the norm is sometimes a quantum leap too far. The one thing I found from working in the chemical industry, so frustrating moving into the farmer industry, if, you, if there's anything in terms of technological advantage that you could get, you used it because it improved speed and efficiency and cost and productivity, but not so much in the farmer, but probably more and more. But even today, on many, many new builds, static spray balls are still the preferred choice, which is quite odd, really, because things have advanced quite a lot since the 1990s. So spray devices, there are generally three categories. Lots and lots of manufacturers, lots of different types, but on the, on the theme, there's generally three categories. And thanks to Alpha Lavelle for these photographs, but there's a fixed spray ball, which is basically, say, custom drilled, this one here. So that's locked in position and these holes are drilled such that they spray in various locations. There's a rotary spray head, which can spray a fan of water around the vessel. So we're actually getting, rather than having water running down the sides, we're actually having water hitting the sides of the vessel as well as the lid. So we're increasing the impact in that case. And then we have the rotary jet heads. And everybody seen the ones outside? Anybody pick them up? Nobody's dropped them on the foot or anything. Yeah. Next time they're going to do a risk assessment for displaying those. And somebody nearly dropped it on the foot. <laughs> those things I touched nearly rolled off the table, but never mind. Um, I might have had quite a hefty bill for breaking that as well. But okay, and rotary jet head, and we've seen examples of that. I'll show you how it works rather than try and explain it from that. But basically, they they have a spray pattern whereby um, this one's also got spray spraying down, but you tend to find a lot of the custom ones will only spray just off the horizontal and on the surface. And, you know, but generally the spray patterns from a general 360 evenly spaced device would do that. And these are just flow and impact ratios. So for a fixed spray ball, we may have a flow of 100 and the impact factor will be 10. These are old slides, so no helpful of they'll have Quite a lot more detail if anybody wants it, I'm sure they could provide it. We have rotary spray heads which produce a fan that goes round and impacts the entire surface. And because of that, we're increased, we've re we can reduce the flow. We don't need so much, but we've increased the impact factor. And then we go to rotary jet heads which spray a spiral of a high energy jet of, of fluid onto the side. And because it's geared such, it will track around. The track width will depend on the gearing in there. But because you've got a much harder impact, you don't just get the impact of the... If, if your jet's that wide, the effective impact area is a lot wider than that. So um, because of that, our flow's again reduced, but our impact's much higher. So as we move towards these, then we reduce in the flow we're increasing the impact. That can have significant effects on how quickly we clean, how much energy we use, and how much fluid and materials we use, and how much we have to discharge. So the energy savings from the top to the bottom increase dramatically. So here are some spray videos. And outside, there's a 
something that looks like a big cylindrical, uh, lovely shiny mirror polished stainless steel and mechanical polish uh, of a, of a pop-up spray ball. So if I click this, this is a pop-up spray ball. So the water pressure in the slide drives it down. Sides in a fixed position, it will spray in the same place every time. And as the CIP fluid backs off, then it retracts back in. Now the, these are useful if you're actually putting um, the cleaning head into a, for example, you may have a pneumatic powder transfer, you don't want a cleaning head stuck in that. So these things can retract. If you've got a ribbon blade mixer, you don't want a static head permanent there because it will chop off in the ribbon blade so pop-up spray balls can be used in those examples and this is one that's not off of that and sorry again to uh, from kilo labs which i got off the, the internet this is showing uh, the rotary spray devices down here and it's spraying off into the various nozzles so you can see it can anybody see some issue with that See, so actually, it might be a bit of splashing, but we haven't got any uh, any flow really in this portal here. So, possibility is we fail a rover to fly the flavour test. More importantly, we wouldn't clean. And that's just showing you where the spray core is, um, where you can see the custom when you could before it started running down the side. This is showing the cascade down the sides that you get from it. Sorry about the noisy pump. But. So if we look at the fixed spray balls, looking at the time, but we've got, with fixed spray ball, a lot of volume, we've got a small amount of impact, and potentially even chemical temperature and a time factor here. So if we go to a rotary spray device, again this is thanks to Alpha Lavelle. It's very difficult to see, but basically you can see very softly a fan of water that is going from top to bottom as it goes round and repeats in itself. So in that case, we're actually using a bit of there you go, free advertising from me about that for Alpha Lavelle. But you've then got impact on the whole surface as well as the top dish of the vessel with the rotary spray device. So we've got um, various cleaning. Now what we've done here, because we've increased the level of impact, we've potentially reduced the time a little bit. We've started to make some dramatic inroads in terms of the volume of CIP. Because we've got more impact, we don't have to keep putting the volume through as we normally would. We clean it more quickly with smaller volume. We potentially could squeeze the temperature down a little bit, maybe, because we've got more impact action. Potentially reduce the chemical a little bit. Um, so we've got a little bit of time saving, reasonable volume saving, because we've increased the impact. Coverage, hopefully, will still be 100%, but we've got more impact. And then we go to the rotary jet head. And this is that in action, so you can see it's turning on two axes. It's turning around the shaft and it's rotating around the head as well. So as that happens, one of these tracks will track all around the side. Because we've got a level of impact, and I'll talk about later, it's possible to have a sensor that determines that. And you can tell by the sound of the impact of how much extra impact we've got there. So when we look at that, we basically then Increase the impact significantly, reduce the volume dramatically, reduce the time, potentially reduce the temperature, and certainly reduce the chemical. So as we move to these, we can actually start making some significant energy savings. And I know Alpha Laval would argue it's a more effective way of cleaning as well. Um, clearly a bigger outlay in terms of investment because they cost a lot more than a static spray head, but you have to look at the overall picture. You've got to create, you've got to run this cleaning hundreds of times effectively. Every time you do, you save a little bit of energy. This is just another comparison showing again the difference between the static in terms of time and 
level of increase of action, reduction of temperature, and reduction of chemical. So the more impact we can get, basically, the better. And you can tell that when you run something under a tap, you dribble the throw across, then it's not going to clean as quickly as if you use full throw. So what I'll do is, there is a little bit after this looking at limits, pharmaceutical limits, and that will actually, it's on the memory stick, so you can look at that, um, about how they're calculated. What I'll do is I'll just summarise on static versus rotary devices, and we'll call it a day there, if that's okay, um, because I've covered the main things I need to cover. Um, but static spray devices, their advantages are they're simple, relatively inexpensive, no moving parts, low possibility of shedding material by wear and tear because there's no moving parts, disadvantages that we need large CIP, <coughs> volumes, large energy because we may got more temperature, uh, more volume to pump, uh, chemical usage, potential high waste disposal as well because we've got masses of volume to get rid of. There's a low impact as we've seen, certainly on the sides where we haven't got the impact from the, the drilled directional flow. They also make excellent strainers. Small holes can easily block and you lose 100% coverage. If you've got one hole that's directed at a portal or a nozzle that's difficult to clean, and by the nature of that it's going to build up materials and residues. If that hole's not detected and it's blocked, and you've got a massive potential for building up contamination that then can contaminate the next batch of manufacture. <coughs> so as a regulator, you'd want to look at somebody's got fixed spray balls and how long, how often and the frequency of inspection of them, because that is critical. And what do you do if you find it's blocked? Do you reject the 50, 100 batches of material that <coughs> have gone out the door? From a ethical point of view, you'd say yes, but I don't know a pharma company that would. They'd write some rationale to why it was okay. But how can you prove it's okay? So it's just a, a thing to consider. So as you <coughs> say, the accumulated debris will stay there until somebody cleans it out, basically. Rotating devices, advantages, reduced CIP fluid usage, reduced energy usage, greater impact, especially with the jet head devices. Disadvantages, moving parts, possible of wear and introduction of particles. Um, if the head stops turning, the cleaning efficiency or effectiveness is drastically reduced. I want to say there are ways to verify the unit is turning. That might be electronic sensors that will listen to the sound of the rotary spray head and detect it if, it's, if it changes. There will be a certain sound that you can analyze and check even with a, a relatively simple computer system. If you've got a rotating jet head, then you can have impact sensors that fit into the flush with the vessel that every time it tracks, it hits it and it detects that it's turning. You can even build that in to your validation that it maybe goes over four times before it stops and you can have some time factor on that to show that it's still working within the design factor. So the other one is visually looking through the side glass, but as you saw, very difficult to do that from that glass we actually looked at. So there you are. I think a lot of the problems are as well is some people fit various devices that are relatively inexpensive, maybe not from reputable pharmaceutical suppliers, and they drop apart. And then the rumour mill starts or somebody's fitted a rotary device and it fell apart and contaminated two batches and it cost us a million pounds and four weeks downtime. Then the key is buy the right parts, have the right system in for detecting their working, back it up with proper maintenance and inspection as well. If you're running static spray devices, recognise the risks associated with them. The drawback side is going to take you longer to clean. You can use more energy, more liquid, have bigger effluent costs. But you've got to inspect them regularly. So that's just... Um, and the next part was on cleaning limits. And anybody interested in cleaning limits? <coughs> don't nod 
can nod your head, but I'm just looking at the time. It's now 10 past. Um, I'm quite happy for you to go through it individually with you over the phone and things. But basically what I've tried to do with the presentation, it's on the memory stick, is to look at what the pharmaceutical limits are and how. I might just, talking myself into this, just show you one slide. If we imagine we've got a manufacturing vessel and we've got one product going to another, and what we've done is we've manufactured one product and we've cleaned it. And after cleaning, we've got, basically, if anybody can see it, I've just materialised a red line, and that's showing the contamination that's there. And that contamination will always be there to a certain level. It's very difficult to remove it. And that level will create a risk to the product. And what we'll do is we'll put in the next batch. So we fill it up, and we basically then agitate it. Well, what type of agitator is that? <laughs> you failed. I don't know. And basically what we've done is we've dispersed that contamination then uniformly. So we've got, we've, we've got the assumption all the residues are uniformly distributed on that surface when we put the next batch in. They uniformly distribute into that. And here we're filling, uh, well, what's that? 25 vials. So it's a fairly small batch. And then when we fill that, basically what we do, because I've very cleverly put 50 dots in there, is we put two dots of contaminant in every product. Um, and that is based on the best case contamination cycle. So the therapeutic dose limits we look at, a lot of the cases that are applied, if we apply it across the whole equipment surface, it's on the presumption that we've got best case carryover. That's all residues uniformly distribute on equipment, we have complete transfer to the following batch and uniform distribution within the following batch. A lot of liquid plants, that's probably quite apt. You get into solid dose plants, then it's very difficult to justify that. So what we do, what they're interested in, those red dots pose a risk to the patient. So how many red dots we've got there should be the basis of the limits that we apply to the equipment. So we work back on cross on contamination. The most kind, what we say, is a thousandth of the minimum therapeutic dose of the contaminating, contaminating product will appear in the minimum daily dose of the following product. So we've taken the minimum dose of the contaminant, we've divided it by a thousand, and we say that's the limit we are allowed in the maximum daily dose of the following product. Basically, the more product we take, the more contaminant we take. So if our maximum daily dose was one unit would take two contaminating dots. If we take five a day, then we'll take ten. So we have to limit what we see in terms of the maximum. And if we go into cleaning agents, then we have to minimise that as well. We have to validate we can remove cleaning agents. And we do that by looking at the toxicity of them and calculating an acceptable daily intake. And that is within all the presentations. Very difficult to go through a cleaning validation presentation, cleaning presentation in one hour, but that's the best I can do for now. Okay, thank you.